John McCauley. I'm the product specialist for Ophir Spiracon. Ophir Spiracon, uh, many of you probably recognize the name of the company, but we um, manufacture and provide solutions in laser performance measurement tools, laser power and energy meters, laser beam profilers, and things of the like. You know, uh, why is the sky blue? I don't know if you have kids or, or if you've ever even really wondered, but maybe uh, your kids have asked you, Daddy, why is the sky blue? And I'm cer I've certainly got that question. And we look outside and we see a nice blue sky today and uh, I think we can all agree that it's a great day to sit inside and talk about laser applications, right? I think, uh, I think we can all agree on that. But why is the sky blue? Uh, we'll certainly um, delve into that topic here momentarily. But primarily what we'll be talking about is a, a new method of um, non-contact focus spot uh, size and position monitor for high-powered YAG fiber and diode lasers. This afternoon we'll talk about problems associated with high-power fiber laser processing. I'm sure anybody in this room is probably more uh, familiar with that than, than I am. Uh, limitations of today's measurement solutions. We'll also talk about new, a new method that eliminates today's limitations. We'll also talk about high, how it works and then we'll reintroduce the question why is the sky blue and how that relates to me laser measurements and then I'll show you how it, uh, how it performs, show it in use. So with uh, today's automotive and aerospace and aviation applications, the type of applications that we're talking about primarily are cutting, welding, cladding, drilling. These are all uh, topics that we've already uh, discussed um, at great detail in this conference. But with any of these laser applications, there are some, obviously some problems um, with uh, controlling, controlling the process. And I think anybody who has uh, dealt with any of these laser applications or high-powered lasers can agree that if you don't have the right tools for measurement, um, your, um, your attempts to control the process have just become more difficult. Um, so as we talk about these applications, we'll be talking about how laser measurement is uh, important for the control of these processes and the development of the applications. Laser researchers and manufacturers are reaching new heights in laser power. I think everybody knows that uh, the, specifically the uh, average powers of fiber lasers are going up and up, and um, the application of these fibers, uh, fiber lasers, diode lasers, are, um, are reaching new heights as well. Um, so as you can imagine, um, there's a problem with uh, measuring these lasers. So knowing the laser power with the focus spot size and location is critical in many industrial applications. I think anybody doing material processing can uh, agree that the, uh, the measurement of the power density at the application is crucial. And not only the measurement of the power density, but also where the focus spot is in relationship to the material that's being processed. So those are a couple of, of the problems that, um, that come with these processes. The measurement of high power uh, lasers is, if you've ever tried to measure a laser, a uh, high power laser, which I have, it's sometimes difficult to, uh, to achieve. And sometimes it's even impossible to achieve uh, by conventional uh, methods such as using a camera or scanning slip profiler or a spinning needle or whatever, uh, whatever you're using to measure that, uh, to measure that laser. Uh, there's a picture of an attenuation device that Spirecon makes, and you see that the, uh, the sampling wedge, the first sampling wedge, is cracked, and it's due to uh, an, an exceeding of a power density on that particular material. Um, the Primus Focus Monitor is the current uh, industry standard, has been uh, mentioned in the conference already, and it certainly is a device that has served, uh, served this, uh, this room very well in the, in the past. Um, it does give a lot of information about the beam, and it, it certainly is, you know, I don't want to talk bad about Primus, because it certainly is a good product. Um, however, there are some problems with the use of the product. The one that it requires a probe to, um, to impinge on the beam, and there are some uh, the problems with doing that um, as laser powers and therefore power densities go up and up. Um, the, the limitations of the device are, are clearly seen, so there are possibilities of damaging, damaging the device. And there's also the possibility of touching that probe right there, that spinning probe, which uh, can also um, affect your measurements. It is power limited, and it, it cannot, uh, just the way that it acquires the data, it can't 
Um, it can't detect any focus drift, any, uh, any shift within the focus spot. So we at SpireCon lately have introduced a new solution called BeamWatch, it, which is the first um, device to measure very high powers without having to intercept the beam or otherwise disrupt the beam like a spinning wire or a camera profiler does. So it is a completely pass-through device. Um, and we'll talk about how that works and the advantages of uh, this technique. So how does it work? You've got a very crude drawing here uh, with a laser delivery head that's delivering a laser, a focus spot to a uh, particular plane. And the beam watch, what it does is it actually uh, images that particular plane. So it's looking at that um, focus spot, that caustic of the beam. So what do blue skies have to do with beam watch? Does anybody, uh, you might have been wondering why I opened up with that, uh, that particular uh, phrase, attention to the blue sky. There's a concept called Rayleigh scattering. It's a physical property. Um, and I'll just read here because I'm not that much of an expert on it. But as light moves through the atmosphere, most of the longer wavelengths pass straight through. And then sun is white light, right? So short, but shorter wavelengths of light are absorbed by the air molecules and then radiated in different directions. So we see the white light, um, we see the white light right here um, hitting the guy. And we see um, the white light that is reflected off of air molecules in the different directions. So as a result, um, the blue, which is, uh, which is most easily visible by our, our eyes, is seen. So that's why, there is a, that's why there is a blue sky. If we look at this graph right here, this is the intensity of scatter changes with wavelength. And if you look at this particular graph, you might wonder, why isn't the sky violet, right? Because it, uh, there's, there's, more, there's more sensitivity at, that, at those particular wavelengths. Well, here's the answer. If you look at this graph, this graph is the um, responsivity of our eyes to different wavelengths. And it turns out that our cones in the back of our eye see the blue wavelengths easier than any other wavelength. So around 420 to 440 nanometers, our eyes pick up that color more easily than any other color. So here is an image of a laser beam that is focused through our beam watch monitor and you can see that it's blue in color. That the image is, is in BeamWatch is not the laser beam itself, but it is actually Rayleigh scattering that's happening off of that relatively high power density that the laser beam is providing as the beam passes through. So the camera views that image, it gets a usable signal, and then the software starts to look for that signal. So you see the red uh, lines that are outlining that, uh, that laser caustic. So once the software has found that caustic, it starts to do some analysis on it. You see this rectangle that is, that is wrapped around the caustic. We call that our region of interest. So this is, really the, uh, this is really the region that gives us all the information that we need in order to measure uh, this laser. This is um, our, uh, one of the interfaces that we provide with the BeamWatch system. It's called our technician's interface. You see um, to the left there, you see the image of the beam. You see the caustic that is outlined, and you also see the, uh, the region of interest. You also see a couple of markers, one red, one green, and I'll talk about those in a second. Um, you see the numbers that it is producing at the upper right. You see a graph of the caustic in the middle right, and then you actually see a 1D profile of the laser spot at the bottom right. When we talk about the different measurements that the BeamWatch product provides, it provides a uh, propagation ratio and a beam parameter product. So this is a, an analysis of the beam caustic. It will provide a real-time M-squared measurement as well as a, a BPP for that laser system. It provides the waste width or the focused spot size also in real time. But it also provides waste location. And the waste location is based off a user entry. So for instance, if you have a 200 millimeter focal length lens that you're using, you enter that information into the software and it will give an absolute uh, measurement off of that entry. But it will also give you a relative, um, a relative focus spot shift measurement. So this is how far and how quickly the focus spot is shifting from uh, where it is supposed to be. 
Uh, you also see this red uh, graph here at the top of the uh, top of the middle right there. That is a relative power measurement. So the user would in enter a a uh, power that the system is outputting, and it will give you a relative power measurement based on that setting. This is the uh, technician's interface I talked about a second ago. So this is. Uh, in the event that you have a laser technician who has to go on site to troubleshoot a laser to see what's happening uh, with that particular laser system, this is the interface that is given to them. They see, again, the caustic and all of the, uh, all of the pertinent uh, information that's given about the laser. Any, you know, any measurement that the, uh, that the system provides, it will be provided in the technician interface. It was also uh, through our market research. Uh, was also um, we were also told that in order to uh, provide this to end users, we needed to have some kind of simple interface. So this is the what we call the operator or the shop floor interface. It also provides a uh, a picture of the caustic as well, but it also based on parameters uh, a setup before uh, the device is integrated into a work cell. So it gives the, uh, the end user a very simple way to see that the laser is operating within the design parameters. Just to demonstrate that there is, uh, because it does not intercept with the beam at all, uh, this, is a, this is just a brief demonstration of uh, measuring a 100 kilowatt fiber laser. Um, this is an IPG laser that over in Japan. We got the, the opportunity to go over and to measure uh, this laser. So you see behind that large round device is the first commercially available 100 kilowatt uh, power meter. It's uh, based on a calimetric pr uh, principle. And you also see the Spiracon beam watch, which is uh, imaging the focus spot as it passes through the device. The laser system itself uh, is, again, it's got a 100 kilowatt fiber source but it also has a processing head with, um, with reflective optics. So um, a lot has been talked about reflective versus, versus transmissive optics, and this is a processing head with uh, reflective optics. I just thought I would tell you that. So this is as the laser turns on, this is the first frame. You see the red marker there off to the left. That is where the focus spot started off, and the green marker is where it currently is. So you see, you'll see over the course of time here, um, over several seconds, that the focus spot will actually shift about eight and a half millimeters for this particular laser on this particular processing head. You see the graph of uh, focus spot position over time. Uh, that's an example of me actually measuring a 100 kilowatt fiber laser, which uh, to my knowledge can't really be done <laughs> other than with this device. So some talk about some unique features that this particular device offers. It is an almost instantaneous measurement of the beam. So within 60 milliseconds of turning the device on, uh, you are getting a measurement. And every, every 60 milliseconds, you're getting, uh, you're getting another statistic on that particular system. It measures beam characteristics, including the caustic measurements, beam parameter product, uh, M squared, the focus spot size, but also because it is a real-time device, it's giving uh, focus spot drift measurements as well. Uh, so how far and how quickly that particular uh, laser system will have its focus, focus spot shift. There is nothing in the beam path. It's been talked about before. It's a completely pass-through device. There is no cooling required for this device. Uh, there is no damage from the laser as long as it's set up properly, obviously. And there is no upper limit. There is a lower limit of a kilo, about a kilowatt. Um, but it's been mentioned earlier, there's not too much um, interest in what the focus shift is doing at a, about a kilowatt. Um, but as you, as you go up, uh, it becomes a, a factor. So one kilowatt and up does require some level of uh, power density in order for the device to provide accurate measurements. Uh, it is included with a giggy camera interface for industrial applications. There are no moving parts. Um, so that's, that's a, certainly a selling feature. There's nothing to, to move or to, or to damage with respect to moving or shipping. Um, and it does come with either a comprehensive technician's interface or a more simplified uh, operator interface, the shop floor interface is what we're calling it. And it is a patent pending uh, process device. So in summary, um, industrial laser applications demanding higher and higher lasers uh, in their processes. I think everybody is uh, familiar with that and, and uh, everybody can agree on that. 
As laser powers increase, application development and process control become more difficult without the proper uh, measurement solutions or even methods to measure the, uh, the process. So Spyrocon's beam watch uses Rayleigh scattering uh, to instantaneously and accurately measure critical laser beam, para uh, beam parameters to better characterize laser, a laser's time-based behavior. These measurements can then be, be used to, to better qualify laser applications, to simply monitor high laser power processes as the, as the laser is used, and to more easily troubleshoot uh, laser problems. That's all I have. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? Very good question. Uh, yes and yes. Um, one thing I failed to mention is that it requires a positive purge of a gas pressure, whether it be a clean air or a uh, nitrogen. I don't really think we found that it, that it matters too much what kind of, of air that you purge it with, but it does need to be purged for a couple reasons. One, to keep it clean on the inside, and number two, um, the dust that the laser is colliding with will actually throw off the measurements as well, so it's an effort to uh, keep the dust out of it. So we, we feel um, that by doing that, that's going to keep the device relatively clean, even in an industrial environment. What you're measuring is the actual uh, reflection that the laser light has as it collides with air molecules. So you've got an environment that is either uh, gas purged or some kind of air, and the light, the laser light, because it has a relatively high power density, very concentrated light, that high power density will collide off of air molecules and be directed into the camera. So the camera is actually imaging the, la the light, the laser light that is colliding with air molecules. Regardless of what gas is used, um, the concentrated laser light is going to collide with, that, with whatever is presented in there. So the Rayleigh scattering will happen regardless of what gas. Now we have been asked how does that affect the measurement going from gas to gas, and what we found is that it really doesn't affect the measurement that much. That's correct. It, it has been brought up in the, the, in the discussions how, does, uh, how do effects on humidity uh, temperature affects the measurements. That's, that's really why we put a low spec on it of one kilowatt because anything less than what we found about it is about a kilowatt. Anything less than that, those effects that you're talking about are going to have an effect on the measurement. So that's why we put that low spec on there. Anything, it, it really is a function of power density. The more power density you have, the more of a signal that you have and the more easily it is to measure that signal.